I think it was February last year, there was a BBC Two uh, documentary um, called Simon's Choice. And it was about uh, Simon Binner, who was a man who had motor neuron disease, and uh, wanted to end his life in Switzerland. Now, it was a very interesting film that I very much, uh, well, I enjoyed it as the wrong word, a very moving film. But the thing that struck me most about that film was the interaction between the Swiss doctor who interviewed Simon, um, the way that she probed Simon as to why he wanted to take the decision that he took, uh, how, how you know, to understand his character, um, the background that led to his decision, uh, understand him as a person. Uh, in order to be very clear that it was the right thing for him before actually helping him in the, the way that she did. Uh, that contrasted in the film very much with the doctors in the UK who couldn't have the sort of discussions that Simon needed to have. And so, of course, the doctor who appeared in that film that I'm talking to in Switzerland is Eric Caprice. So I'm delighted to, to welcome her here today uh, to tell us a bit more about the organisation that she set up and runs. So, Erica. Thank you so much. And uh, most important for me is that please ha hold your hand when you don't understand. I would like even the most back ones back sitting ones to understand what I'm saying. So please, please interrupt when you don't understand because of the microphone or my language. Uh, how to let death become a ceremony of life. This is a very contro controversial discussion about something that concerns us, all of us at 100%. And it's amazing, something that is 100% sure in life, uh, that many, many people cannot discuss about this matter. Um, maybe not everybody knows how I became to support assisted dying. I am a GP. I'm working in Switzerland and I have done palliative medicine only for 20 years. Almost all my patients die at home and I am proud that they do not have to go to nursing homes, hospitals, that we look after them and keep them at home uh, right until the end of, of life. Uh, after 20 years of palliative care, I have seen some people die in a manner that made me be afraid of my own death because not all palliative care dyings are acceptable, neither for the patient nor for the family members. And then uh, fate made me experience assisted dying with the death of my father. He had a second stroke at the age of 82 and lost his speech completely. He didn't find a word anymore. And, uh, he could express himself with being angry or showing happiness and that was it. So it was very difficult for him to live like that. Uh, before he had the second stroke, he had uh, somebody visiting him at least twice a day. So he was a very socially active man. And uh, he tried to kill himself by taking all the pills that he found within my house. And I had three little children. He lived with me and my three little children and there was nothing that could kill him, but he slept for three days. I did not put him to hospital because I hoped that he could uh, die. Then he woke up and he started to point onto the picture of a, a, a train and made signs that he's going to kill himself by jumping under the train. And in that moment, I said, look, Dad, you cannot do that. This is even worse than assisted dying. Assisted dying was bad for me that time. I knew that it exists in Switzerland and I couldn't accept this, it as a palliative thinking doctor. But 
harming himself, the train driver, other people who have to collect the body, uh, this was even worse. And this experience, my father sitting beside me, putting his head on my shoulder and sleeping away. This was a very special experience to me because uh, I started uh, reflecting, is palliative care the only way we should die? Is it necessary that sometimes we uh, have this railing, this horrible sound when the mucus starts collecting in, in the lungs? Or is there also another way of going like my father did? And my father did a last goodbye, a last ceremony before he had his state when he left. It was, it was difficult for me and I had religious uh, uh, problems because we have been brought up very religiously. So I thought it was a sin to let him go, besides that I was palliative care thinking doctor and also from my profession couldn't accept it. Now it's 12 years since my father died and I'm standing in front of you and I can tell you if it was a sin I would not be standing here. If there is a God, if there is religion, if it was a sin I think I would not be standing here in full health. I have never been as happy as I am now in my life. I've got a wonderful partner and uh, I would like to tell you about how to make uh, life be self-responsible way of living and self-responsible way of dying. Uh, I have been working for six years with Dignitas. Um, after the death of my father, I had many experiences, very good experiences with Dignitas. What I did not like is that I could not invest myself to legalization. As I had further uh, experience with assisted dying, I saw that there is one very bad point about assisted dying. And this is that people have to travel in a health stage, health condition, that every doctor would say he is unfit to travel. We have people from Europe, we also have people from the USA, we have people from Australia. How can you travel around the world in a health condition, non-fit to travel? But they do it anyway because they want to end their suffering. And uh, I said I would like to quit with Dignitas, not because they are doing a bad job, they are doing a wonderful job, but because I want to stand here, talk to you and have my own organization to tell you about my experiences. And I have founded Life Circle, an organization, an association and a foundation, Eternal Spirit, in 2011. Whenever somebody is uh, promoting assisted dying, I think they should also promote life. They should make sure that everybody has done everything to promote life quality. Don't leave life too early. This is the most important thing for me. I love to live and I enjoy life and I do not want anybody to leave life too early. This is why everybody who is thinking about an assisted dying must become member of Life Circle, of the association Life Circle, before he is applying for an assisted dying with the Foundation Eternal Spirit. Within the association Life Circle, we try to promote quality of life. We give people electric wheelchairs to be able to go out of the house again. We give them care at home. We do living wills with them. We try to keep life quality as high as possible and push the, the wish to die in the background for some time. But there will be a moment we get older every day, there will be the moment where the person says, 
Now I can't go on no more. I want to have an assisted dying. And then this person, member of Life Circle, applies for assisted dying with the Foundation Eternal Spirit. Why is it a foundation? Uh, I was hoping that the moment that somebody says, I do this only to earn money, will never come. And this is why I founded uh, Eternal Spirit as a foundation. Every foundation is checked by the government of Switzerland at least once a year, and the government of Switzerland can check the finances of a foundation anytime during the year. All payments that are made for an assisted dying are not paid to a private person, but are paid to the foundation. And the foundation pays uh, funeral costs, um, pays the doctors, pays the apartment that we have for assisted dying. So it should be clear that not one person is having profit of assisted dying. I have been accused anyway by the Swiss government of leading people to death um, only because of money. But it was this, this complaint was rejected. So now we're having peace at the moment by financial means. Uh, the Spirit, Eternal Spirit Foundation's most important aim is to get legalization in all other countries. I said there is only one bad point about assisted dying, and this is that people have to travel to Switzerland and that people have to pay a lot of money because everything is horribly expensive in Switzerland. I want to stop suicide tourism and I will stop it when we have legalization in all other countries. And this is why I need the help of all other countries. This is again Life, life Circle stands for palliative care, help, information, uh, living wills and mainly get life quality as high as possible as long as possible and the eternal spirit foundation my most important moment is really to get this suicide tourism stopping uh, the way abortion to tourism was stopped when it was legalized in all countries uh, we call our association Life Circle. We wanted to call it Circle of Life, but this was in the internet no good because there were so many bad things about it with uh, Circle of Life, so it is Life Circle now. But we have a Circle of Life. We have so many ceremonies within our life. Birth is being given today on the means of the mother. The mother can choose. Do I have uh, underwater birth? Do I have birth at home? Do I have birth in a, in a hospital? Or do I have a caesarean? Nobody is complaining if the mother decides how this child will be born. It has his baptism, maybe, a wonderful ceremony. On the left, you see my daughter. She had a wonderful ceremony doing the postgraduate. You might have marriage. You might have your own family with wonderful moments, wonderful ceremonies of life. You might do a wonderful trip with a great partner. Again, ceremonies, quality of life. And when you are very old, uh, you start going towards the end of life, but you can still have wonderful moments, wonderful ceremonies. My father fell in love when he was 81 with a lady of age 84. And I remember at that time, uh, I was quite unhappy because my partner, le partner left me. And my son at the age of 16 was in love with his girlfriend and my father, my son, they were in love holding hands and, and, and well, I, I was a bit jealous. <laughs> but 
life can change and that's the good thing about it. <laughs> Within the circle of life you go on, get to the high point and then you definitely go down again. You might be back in your nappies. You might be back at the moment where you cannot speak anymore like my father. But with the child, with the baby, it's going to get better. With the very old person, it's definitely not going to get better anymore. And what are those two people, what are they talking about? Are they talking about like my father with his girlfriend of age 84? What are we going to do? Buy a car. Enjoying life, that's wonderful. Uh, are they talking about living wills? Do you have a living will? I do not want to have a life prolonging uh, means when I, when I get very ill. Uh, we do not know what they are talking about, but they, they are enjoying life and this is what is so important. They are talking about means of the end of life and it should be talk, talked open, openly about even end of life. At most important when you are really uh, at high age. The raising life expectancy, what does that mean to us? This is 1860, a completely normal, normal pyramid of age. That's the way it should be. This is the year 2000. You see what happened. In the year 2000, I was one of the baby boomers. I'm still one of the baby boomers. This is year 2025. So I'm, I'm about somewhere up there now. Hmm? And uh, I would like to live quite long. You see this, 2050. I'm going to be 92 in 2050. I would like to live until 92 if I stay as well as the two old people. I would love to get old as long as I'm okay. So I'm going to be one of those up there. We're going to have a big problem. Huh? And who are the baby boomers? These are the ones of the generation uh, hippie, doing it yourself, uh, Beatles, and these people have um, gained another, um, another way of living, another way of self-decision, and they will not make or let, they will not let doctors decide about their death because they always decided about their life and they have taken responsibility, more responsibility than ever has been taken. I do it my way. And they will not let doctors take their responsibility from them when they have to think about dying. So this is going to be a very interesting part of life and I'm looking forward to the age of 1995. Hope I reach it. This is what we would like. Stay in acceptable good health right at high age. But when we think, those two people, they might have been together for 60 years. They are on their path. They are maybe on their last path. And shouldn't it be their decision where they go? If they are still okay, mentally okay, and they can just decide themselves, nobody would say, oh, you have to go right, you have to go left. But as soon as they are ill, doctors will decide whether they go right or left. And what happens if this man has lost his wife? She died before him and uh, he turned very ill, terminally ill, uncurably ill, and he tells the 
nice lady who is looking after him in hospital, look, I cannot go on. What, what shall the nurse say? What shall he do? Have a look at this. This is the worst thing that can happen. This is Netherlands. In the year, year 2010, Netherlands has assisted dying. They have a legalization of assisted dying. And anyway, they have a lot of unassisted heart suicides. And what is most horrible on this picture is that the highest amount of unassisted suicides jumping under the train like my father wanted to do is at the age 80 plus. Old age rational suicide unassisted. And this is what happens in all countries. When, the, when we do not give the people the possibility of assisted dying, they will do it themselves. They say, I can no more go on living. And then they say, yes, I can do it my own way. And this is what we have to stop by legalization of assisted dying. There's such a big difference between the unassisted suicide where somebody is leaving earth without telling anybody, without having family members with him and leaving a lot of pain, a lot of open questions. With assisted dying, you can tell people, you can say goodbye, grieving work is done before, and everybody who wants can be with the person. Like birth in the beginning of life, where nowadays people can be there, not only the mother alone, also at the end of life, people can be there when somebody is doing an assisted dying. This is a very important picture to me. This is the ceremony of death. This is my father, two days before he died. I asked him, Father, are you looking forward to what is going to happen in two days? As he couldn't speak anymore, he expressed his joy by clapping his hands and with his face. And you can really see how much he is looking forward to leave this earth. You see the glass of wine. He was nicely dressed. We had one last ceremony of life. And two days later, after having said goodbye to his family members, his friends, he left in peace, putting his head on my shoulder, sleeping away without any problem. Having this possibility that my father learned me to accept, uh, having this possibility made the fear of my own death go away. And we have two-thirds of people who are accepted by Life Circle to have an assisted dying in case that it gets unbearable. Two-thirds never come for the assisted dying. How come? They know they have this urgency exit. If it gets really unbearable, I can die with an assisted dying. But as they have to travel to Switzerland, Often they have to come too early because of this stupid traveling matter. I wish I could travel to them, to their home, instead of them coming to me. It would be less expensive, it would be more human, and it would save them from traveling and from coming too early because they are afraid of not being able to travel. So we do need legalization in all countries. This is my biggest wish and I will not stop fighting for legalization before we have it. I thank you all for listening to me and uh, if there are any questions, please ask. Um, my question is about the living will. Um, having made it, having given a 
copy to the GP. I would like to know what you think. How should one be able to convey that message if, in case something happens suddenly? Especially if your partner is not supportive of the idea or doesn't think like you. How, like when you collapse, how can you make sure that there is no CPR? This depends on the legislation of the country. In Switzerland, up to 2013, which is not long ago, the doctors did not have to respect a living will in Switzerland. If they thought it was better to do an artificial nourishment or to do a CPR, they did it because they knew better. And since 2013, people stood up and said, we want to have the possibility, if a doctor does not respect our living will, we want to have a court case against him. Since we have this law that people can have a court case against doctors if they do not respect and do the CPR, even though a living will is there, um, we have very, very few people who have a CPR without uh, uh, the doctor's respect. Um, there is one problem. If you would fall from your chair now, at this moment, and I knew you have a living will, I would do a CPR to you. Why would I do that, even with a living will? Because if I react in a good way, you will sit on the chair again after some time. You have a very high possibility to become as well as you are now. Do you love to live now in the condition that you are now? No. Not really. Then it would have been bad for me to do the CPR. If I do not know the person, I must think he likes to live the way he can now, come here, socialize, um, a living will is respected after two or three weeks in hospital and it looks as if you would not be able to think anymore. If you are unconscious or n not of sound mind anymore for more than two or three weeks and it's unlikely that you will be of sound mind again, then the living will is respected and nothing is done anymore not even given antibiotics or something like that. And I hope the time will come that it will be handled like this in all countries. Can you say something about the criteria that you use to accept people for the life service? Yes. Um, in Switzerland we have a very, very open law, which means you have to be of sound mind, and I shall not make money out of it, which means I'm allowed to earn the amount of money that I earn usually when I work as a GP, and you must be of sound mind. So if you are not ill at all, you would be allowed to do an assisted dying in Switzerland. But I think you would not find the doctor who gives you the permission, who writes the uh, prescription for the medication, if you are uh, not ill at all. I would not do it. Uh, within the Foundation Eternal Spirit, uh, <coughs> you must explain why you ha want to die. You must explain why your life quality is so low that you cannot go on anymore. You must have some kind of uncurable illness. Uh, with the old age rational suicide, people say, well, at the age of 85, you can be fine. There is not one person who is really fine at the age of 85. They are coping with several illnesses, several minor illnesses. And if the amount of several minor illnesses comes to an amount, they say, look, I do not want to go on like this. I can't. I have been struggling for so many years now, I want to say goodbye. Then they are accepted without, bi without big uh, uncurable illness. 
Uh, they must be of sound mind. They must not be influenced by anybody else. The wish to die must be of some duration. It is good to know that they want to die for many months, but there are exceptions. If you start having a pain, upper, upper stomach pain, and the diagnosis pancreas carcinoma, metastases everywhere, and you didn't realize before, you've been in complete health. It comes from one day to the other. And the pancreas carcinoma can kill you within weeks. So in these cases, we must be able to react quick. We cannot say that you must be a member of Life Circle for at least six months. That's not possible in certain illnesses. So your wish to die should be caused by a very, very bad illness short-term illness or a long wish to die. And your family members must be informed. We have made only good experiences with the duty to inform family members. As I said, the difference between the heart suicide and the assisted dying is that family members can say goodbye. It's a culture of death. This is why we want people to inform family members. There are family members, very Catholic Italian people, for example. My wife, I told her, but she is furious. She's completely against it. Well, uh, in such cases, they have to be informed once. And if they cannot accept at all, this person must be able to go anyway, to die anyway in a decent way. And then we accept the family member knows it, it will be in September some, sometime, but they do not know when exactly. Yeah? Uh, my, my question follows, it's, you've answered it a bit, but um, because I've got any chronic fatigue, which in this country is quite a controversial illness, and so my life is 15% of what it used to be. Yes. And I heard that certainly some of the Dignitas doctors wouldn't recognise that. Um, so, um, and also because you talked about how, you know, that, that in Switzerland you get to know somebody and support them and obviously you can't do that if we're in England. So I'd just like a little more detail what you, and I'm only 65, which is, you know, people say, well, if you were 85, that would be all right to them. So I'd just like a bit more mm -hmm. detail. It's kind of similar thing, but... You know, this is again uh, a reason why we need legalization of assisted dying in all other countries. Because the doctor who is looking after you in England would be the person, might be the person, or you might find a doctor in England who can understand your decision. It's difficult from Switzerland if you have such an illness. And in Switzerland, Chronic fatigue is uh, judged as a psychiatric illness because you can't prove any bodily symptoms, somatic symptoms, none at all. You're a completely healthy person, but you have no quality of life at all and you have done everything to get life quality better. And in that case, you would need a very good psychiatric assessment to have the slightest chance with Dignitas, Sex International or Life Circle to have an assisted dying. Mm -hmm. This is a, a health condition which is very dangerous for us, even in Switzerland. Sorry, would you get that psychiatric so, report here? Or in you, no, you don't get it in Switzerland because in Switzerland we have no psychiatrists accepting foreigners for assessments. Uh, the, the psychiatrists say we do not want a horizontal assessment, a moment assess assessment, but we need a vertical assessment. We need to see the people several times to say whether they, they are of sound mind and have no psychiatric illness. And that's the big problem. You can't come to Switzerland for several times and go to a psychiatric assessment. We do not have these psychiatrists in Switzerland who would do that. So you'd have to go to one here? So you would have to get, yes, that's right, that's right. If that is possible, it, I cannot say it is, but it might be possible. But that's the, the most difficult uh, situation that you can have.
there's a question at the back. Mm. If you if you suffer from a dementia and you get you lose your mental capacity because of dementia, an assisted dying will not be possible anymore. You must be of sound mind for an assisted dying in Switzerland. <coughs> Uh, which means if you suffer from dementia, you would have to come much earlier than you actually want to. You must come before you lose your mental capacity. Uh, and I see that a lot of people with dementia wait too long and then they start forgetting what they refused mostly. Huh? So they forget that they did not want to go on living like this and they go on living like this and they run into complete dementia. But your living will must be respected even if you are demented. So doctors would not be allowed to give you antibiotics with pneumonia and they would not be allowed to give you artificial nourishment with dementia. In some stage you will forget how to swallow. And 50% of the demented people will die from a pneumonia because they have been fed, spoon fed, and they do not know how to swallow anymore. They do not know what is uh, hunger, what is thirst. They don't feel uh, the needs of living anymore. So if you would just let nature do its work, accept that they are not hungry anymore, they do not want to eat. They could uh, do uh, uh, starvation dying, sort of, a natural starvation dying, because they, they do not remember that they should eat, and they are not hungry. But they are fed in the nursing homes, and then they get the food in the wrong throat, and they have a pneumonia, and then Doctors must let them die and just do palliative care, give them a little bit of morphine and not resuscitate, uh, not give antibiotics. That would be the right way the, and a natural way. But doctors cannot um, respect the natural way. Let's say it that way. You know, doctors have the feeling that when somebody dies, they um, they have done something wrong and, and that's, that's not good. They do something wrong when they keep such people alive and don't let nature uh, go on. Uh, did, did you say that in the Netherlands there is assisted dying and yet you showed a slide showing um, suicide, the high rates of suicide in the 80s, people in their 80s? Yes, so yes, this, this is right. Uh, you know, the Netherlands, uh, they are discussing about accepting old age rational suicide. In the Netherlands, you should have a bad, uncurable <coughs> illness. You do not have to be terminal, but uh, you should have a very bad, uncurable illness. And uh, this is the big problem. This is why they have such a high rate of, this is ra rational old age suicide. 85, 90, and you have so many illnesses, and then you start forget, getting forgetful. And then you start realizing that you might run into a dementia and go on living in a nursing home. And you have seen your father dying in a nursing home with a dementia, and you don't want this. And they jump from the bridge because they are not accepted. It's, it's, it's not a, a uh, illness which is accepted in the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. First of all, again, my sincerest thanks for your mm -hmm. encouragement and a wonderful talk. Thank you, Doctor. What I want to raise 
is my belief that the, what seems to be indicated is the need for a global awa awareness raising campaign. We need an education campaign, first of all, to address this, the, the, you know, the, the, the human reluctance, the, the massive denial of the reality of death. Mm -hmm. We still have too many organizations which promotes the idea that somehow, magically, we're going to exist after death and we're going to meet up with our loved ones. And I hope that I am not giving offence in this room to people who gain some sort of comfort from such ideas. I, I really do mean that. But I am so passionately concerned to promote the to get people to face the fact that death is a part of life. And, then, and the, the more you actually live your life, the less frightened you're going to be of dying, unless, of course, it does entail really serious pain. If I may, I'd like to have Paul hold on to this microphone for another moment, because hidden somewhere in all of this, we are seeing prejudice against mental suffering is not considered as bad as physical suffering. Mm -hmm. Who is to say which is the worst suffering? I have been all my life plagued by suicidal rumination since I was nine years old. In spite of that, I was able to go on and train to be a psychiatric nurse, a general nurse, and then in late age, or middle age, I, mean, I trained to be a psychological counselor, working in depth with people. So I do feel that I know something about mental, mental and emotional suffering firsthand and professionally working with people, both as patients and clients. We need a global consciousness-raising campaign. And I don't know how where to start other than here, and hoping people are listening. You are, you are absolutely right. The problem is abortion was legalized and accepted in the high 60s. But with abortion, you kill a human being which is not ill and if it had a voice it would cry I want to live and uh, in case of assisted dying we have very ill people and they do not have the strength to stand up like the women pregnant women who stood up and said we want this legalized uh, we have ill people and after the people died we have uh, family members who are very uh, sure. desperate and they do not have the strength to stand up, which means we all have to stand up here and now and say, this is what we want. And have a look, have a look at Omid. Have a look at the cases with Omid and Noel. These are very ill people and they are suffering a lot. They cannot stand up and say, we want. And we all have to help them to get through with their fight. Uh, the, the coming to Switzerland is not what we want. Coming to Switzerland is not the solution. The solution is that everybody can do this at his home. Psychiatric people. My, my son was 19. He was having Christmas with his girlfriend at the family of his girlfriend. An aunt of hers was having Christmas with them, but she was in the psychiatric ward for depression since teenager. For the fifth time, five times she was in a psychiatric ward for a long time. That Christmas she was in the psychiatric ward again. She could go home for two days for Christmas. She would have had to go back to the psychiatric ward uh, on 27th of December. 26th, they had this wonderful family meeting. At 11 o'clock in the evening, she said, I, I'm going to the toilet. She never came back. She took the key and the car, 
they searched for four weeks until they found her in a lake and she knew exactly this lake has a, a possibility to drive with the car in a very deep um, part of the lake and uh, she had a tiny little plastic bag wa uh, waterproof with a letter of goodbye begging the family members for forgiving. Uh, so she knew when she had Christmas with them, she knew what she was going to do, but this should not be yes. necessary. And this is in Switzerland, where we have assisted dying, but where are these psychiatrists? They should have a bad consciousness, but they do not. Uh, and, uh, you know, my son has to live with this. Every Christmas they get reminded of this happening. And this cannot be the solution. <coughs> this is why I'm 100% pro assisted dying also for psychiatric illnesses if they are untreatable. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure. making it my retirement mission to do what I can. I should be in touch with you, all right? Please, God. Yes. I use that word. Uh, thank you very much for all you've said. You said at the start that both you and your father started from a faith position, and uh, just like to ask if you would to share anything about what your current perspective is on that. I don't know whether you come from a Christian background or some other faith perspective, but do you think there is any incompatibility between these issues and the Christian faith? I say this because I think there's a perception in the UK that a lot of the opposition to change on this comes from um, Christian and other faith groups. And that is true to some extent, but there is actually a much bigger diversity within the faith communities that people realise. And if I may just do a quick plug, um, a charity I'm involved in has supported a big project with Cardiff University, which is being launched actually in this building here on Monday, of a whole suite of online resources to help promote Christian discussion around these issues. The website is christiandying.org.uk, mm -hmm. and uh, anyone with Christian contacts might have found that very useful, christiandying.org.uk. But I'd be interested in your own experience and your own reflection. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have been brought up very religiously. My both parents were part of Salvation Army. Salvation, Salvation Army is sort of even worse than Catholicism <laughs> because, you know, they hammer bad consciousness into your soul. At least twice a week we were in this, uh, at school in the Salvation Army we had to sing, if devil comes, just sh throw him out, 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 out. We've been uh, screaming these songs as children. And uh, I would have loved to ask my father, how can you do this? It is a sin to kill yourself. How can you do this and not uh, be afraid of being punished by God? But I couldn't ask him because he couldn't answer. Uh, and uh, I was very much afraid. I have written a book, uh, Father, You're Allowed to Die. Uh, it is not in the bookshop. It can only be... Uh, um, it, it is only sold on our website. Uh, and I explain a little bit, especially the uh, beliefs uh, part, the religious beliefs part. I was afraid for two years that one of my children would die. I was expecting the punishment by God. It is 12 years ago now. And uh, I think if there is a God, he, he does not reject what I'm doing. As I say, I would not be standing here and talking openly about uh, the fact that this is only one of the possibilities, assisted dying is one of the possibilities to go. You know, how many times uh, journalists ask me, are you playing God by saying you're allowed for assisted dying, you're not allowed for assisted dying. I'm not playing God, I'm just listening to the people and I try to accept and understand why they want to do this. And nobody would ask me, are you playing God? If I put a stent in with, uh, when, when they have a, a heart problem, I put a stent 
seven stents, nine stents, he would have died long before. Maybe God wanted to take him home and we have put stents and did not let him die. And then he dies from a horrible cancer or dementia. But who did the bad thing? The people who put the stents or God? who let him, I, I do not believe in a God who is punishing. I do believe in a God who is uh, accepting, a loving God and not a punishing God, an understandful God. And uh, I am, I, I say with 100% conviction that I am the proof of the loving God, the accepting God. And it cannot be bad because, as I say, I had an extremely difficult life. I, if, if you read my book, you know how difficult my life was. And since I founded Life Circle, there was not, not a moment in my life that was better than now. So I'm not punished, it's the opposite. Sorry, um, I didn't quite feel that we reached a, um, a clear conclusion about the sort of services that you might be able to offer for someone who might be um, deteriorating in all sorts of ways, um, and, and including um, at some point dementia. Now, um, I, I, I was rather hoping to find that by writing a living will to make some sort of um, reference to dementia that I would want the, the, uh, the possibility of an assisted suicide in the event of uh, various nasty things that could have happened to me and if I'm um, totally um, I, 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 unable to think clearly. Um, I, I'm no longer myself in other words. So um, are, are, you, are you saying quite categorically that even though I've um, produced a living will and um, filed it with you and I, I've made contact with you and um, th this has gone on for several years, I've updated it, I'm still in, in my the, the last um, time that I've, I've made it, I, I'm totally um, capable um, and I still have the capacity and at some point that capacity is possibly going to disappear. Mm. Now, mm. Um, it seems rather unfortunate that um, I, I've set up all this procedure and, and got agreement that in principle, yes, I would be eligible to have assistance in dying, but suddenly, you know, because something which can happen, as you say, quite quickly, um, precludes that there's something happening which I've you know, yes, tried yes. to build up with you over the years. This is a very big problem. Uh, as soon as you lose your mental capacity and it never comes back, we cannot give assisted dying to you. Because in Switzerland we do not have the medical assisted uh, active euthanasia, we only have assisted dying. Which means, I set an intravenous needle with only saline water. You learn, I teach you how to open the valve of the perfusion. If people are tetraplegic, we have a little machine, they can push a little stick with their head and it opens the perfusion. When you know how to do this, we close the valve of the, of the infusion, put the medication in the bag, and then I have to do a little film because I have to prove to the Swiss authority that you have been of sound mind. You have to answer to the question, what is your name? Okay. What is your date of birth? Why did you come here? Do you know what is going to happen if you open the perfusion? And if you can answer all these questions, you must be of a minimum of sound mind. It proves it. And then I say, so if you really want to die, you can open the perfusion now. It is filmed how your hand opens the perfusion and then the film is stopped. Within 30 seconds you fall asleep, within 4 minutes you die from heart failure. But we must prove that you have been of sound mind, you knew what was going to happen and you have done it yourself. If you are totally demented, 
you will not be able to do it. But, but, but if, if I mean, a lot of people who are um, at early stages of dementia, then that they are um, need something. Um, but a lot, a lot of people in the early stages of dementia, then um, that they are not capable of being left alone for fear that they will um, harm themselves. Um, they'll wander out somewhere and get totally lost and, and forget who they are. But um, I'm, I'm sure that on their return, if you just ask them their name and their date of birth and all the simple questions you've mentioned, they would still be able to answer those. So, um, it depends. It depends. Some need help, but they are still very, very uh, much capable of decision. If you have a middle grade dementia, you need to have an assessment by a psychiatrist or a neurologist. If he says, yes, you are of sound mind, you know what you're doing, then it is possible to have assisted dying in Switzerland, but not if you're completely demented. Yeah, okay. hmm? I think if I just come in here, um, you know, Eric has explained the situation in Switzerland, obviously, yes. uh, uh, very clearly. Um, if you look at other countries, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong when I say this, but my, my understanding is in Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, they do allow euthanasia uh, on the basis of an advanced decision, even if you have lost your mental capacity. Uh, however, uh, in the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, they don't uh, accept foreign nationals. So it doesn't really help us. But when you think about the problems, I think we have to be very careful, actually, of, of people who have uh, lost mental capacity. Um, was it three years ago we had Jan uh, Bernstein from um, Bernheim, from um, Belgium, who came and talked about how um, voluntary euthanasia works in, in Belgium. And um, one of the things that happens in Belgium is that even if people have written an appropriate advanced decision, it doesn't actually get acted on very often. And there's two reasons for this, I think. The first one is that put yourself in the position of a doctor who is being asked to carry out euthanasia on the basis of somebody who no longer has mental capacity, doesn't understand what's happening to them at the time. That is a very difficult decision for any doctor to take. The second uh, concern is um, what about the, um, the person who's lost their mental capacity? What about their family? If somebody has to take the decision, is now the right time? It's a very, very difficult decision to ask anybody else to take. Uh, people will be very reluctant. So in practice, even if you've written an advanced decision and you're in a, uh, a jurisdiction that would, would allow it, um, actually doctors will be very reluctant and your own relatives, your, your healthcare proxies, whatever, would equally likely to be um, very reluctant. Further, I think there was a case in the Netherlands where this procedure was being carried out and the person changed their mind. They, they lost their mental capacity. And they said, oh, stop, stop, you're trying to kill me. What is the doctor supposed to do in a situation like that? You, you know, you have to look at it from both sides. Yes, we obviously respect the interests of the dying person, but there are other people involved. There is the people making decisions, there is the, the, the doctor carrying it out. I think that the the, the argument that says no, actually, you do have to be of sound mind has some ethical judgment behind it. You know, there comes the point where I am often asked, why don't you do euthanasia in Switzerland? Why do you only have assisted dying? I'm very glad about it. I would not be the doctor injecting a deadly poison to somebody. I do not want to kill somebody. I want to give you the possibility to do it yourself in safety and not jump in front of a train. But I would not want to kill anybody who is not of sound mind. I do, I do give you the help to die in 
in peace and in safety and 100% sure that you will be dead afterwards. But I'm glad that we do not have euthanasia. I will <coughs> not be that doctor. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm just going to pick up on one of the things that, that, um, that Phil, Phil said about the, um, the relative having to make a difficult decision if they're doing it on behalf of someone who is collapsing into um, the, the edge of capacity, shall we say, uh, and beyond. And then I think that they're already having to do this because um, the time comes when people have to say, well, you can no longer look after him at home, and so we would have to commit him to some sort of hospital care at home um, or whatever. Now, um, to my mind, that that, that is. Um, the point at, at which the um, alternative of um, assisted dying or euthanasia um, would, 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 could in fact be put into the equation as an option um, at the point of decision of no, they could no longer be looked after in the family. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're right, there are difficult, these are really difficult questions. We're not going to resolve them this afternoon. But there are, you know, there, there are things that uh, um, need to be thought about carefully. It isn't just as simple as, as saying, I've written in my advanced decision, therefore it should, should happen. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I think that the it's my job, because nobody else will do it, to see the relatively small number of people who go from Britain to Switzerland for dementia. And uh, Phil's already made a point about how difficult it can be for the doctors if they had to administer, <coughs> effectively euthanatize someone who was not in a position to give agreement. But you also have to think in terms more generally. I mean, as it is, you go to any old age home and you will see people who say, the doctor's trying to poison me. And it's quite common. People get confused. They're given medicines which are given with, uh, and food which is given only with benevolent intent. Nevertheless, quite a lot of people think the doctor's trying to poison them. Just imagine how that would grow if people knew that doctors could actually poison them. <laughs> it would be quite intolerable. And so I'm afraid that if you, uh, although it, all surveys show that the majority of people, if asked what they would like to happen to them if they go into hospital with severe dementia, they all say versions of, I hope Matron will put something in my tea. But that doesn't happen, and it's not going to happen on any scale, even in countries like Holland and Belgium, where it is theoretically possible. So I'm afraid you all have to learn not to be greedy and not try and live out every last moment of a, of a life which is, or an intellect which is failing to dementia. And you have to decide, unless you're going to leave it to the uncertainties of the doctor, which I'm afraid are very uncertain, if you go into an old folks home, um, you, even if you've made an advanced declaration, you're quite likely to end up with a tube in your stomach through the wall. <coughs> Uh, there are hundreds, thousands of people in Britain with severe dementia who are fed through, not just through a nasogastric tube, but through a tube going straight into their stomach, because nobody is brave enough to take the decision to say, we really should let them die. Right. Nobody, there, there, is, there are lawyers looking over everybody's shoulder, and everybody is terrified, everybody takes the path of the least resistance, and I cannot see any sign of that changing in the next hundred years. <laughs> so I'm afraid you've got to get used to the idea that if you want to do something about dementia, you need to, first of all, as Erica says, make clear your views about death and dying well in advance so that nobody can say you're just having a bad hair day and you know, you'll feel better tomorrow. <coughs> you then have to make sure that you've made your views clear to everybody and you then, at the first sign of dementia, you need to get an assessment, both to prove show the diagnosis, to make sure that it's not a, a treatable dementia, because a small number of dementia are. And you also want to know roughly at what rate you're going to decline, because then you can help to plan things. And if the tests show that you're declining quickly, you have to act quickly. 
if they show that you're declining slowly, you have a year or two or three in which you can make your plan. But I'm afraid uh, there is no alternative in practice in the vast majority of cases to um, taking the decision to go why you still have a few months uh, of life that could be pleasant, and that's just one of the aspects of life that I'm afraid you have to get used to. He likes to be proved wrong. <laughs> this is rather light-hearted after, after the last speakers. Um, thank you for a most inspiring talk and thank the last contributors for what has been very enlightening. Um, I did see your television uh, program and that was, I think, very, very helpful. And it's wonderful to, you know, have had your talk um, now. What I wanted to know was, I do notice that you have pamphlets there, brochures. Um, I trust that they contain details of how to become a member of Life Circle. These are the pamphlets of MDMD. I'll mention those later. I don't know how to open them. Um, I, I if, admit if you look at our website, the MDMD website, there is a link to Life Circle, but if you Google Life Circle, you can... I don't use a computer. Um, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe Eric has a card she can use. I can, I can give you a card. Thank you. Yes. Hello. I, I'd like to come back to the question of the people around the individual who's near the end of life. Because we've just talked about the difficulties doctors face, we've talked about the difficulties that other uh, clinicians face. Um, in, in my experience, one of the big issues after the event is how the family and friends feel. And very often, um, the, the, the person who's near to the end of their life feels under pressure not to to do something to shorten their life because they're under so much pressure from their family. You can't go. Not yet. Uh, just give us a few more weeks, months, whatever. Just long enough until John enters school. Just long enough until... I, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if uh, Life Circle uh, is, sets out to help those around the, the end of life individual in some way to um, make sense of things uh, both before and after the event. You see, there, there again we have a reason why we need legalization in all countries. Because if it was legal here, you could set up groups to help people after the assisted dying. And I know that uh, I think MDMD has set up, or SOURCE has set up a group to help people, family members, after an assisted dying. And uh, the funny part, or the interesting part about it is that if you talk to your family members, they do grieving work before the assisted dying. They understand. And I always say, you want to die then you have the assisted dying and your problem is solved. But the problem of your family members might start then. This is why I ask people when I see there's a problem with family members, please try to give your family members time. My father had the first stroke and I couldn't have accepted him to die after the first stroke. Four years later he had another stroke, he lost his speech. Then still, I did everything to stop him from doing it. And I'm glad that I was in the position of the family member, of the grieving person afterwards. I can understand what you are going through. And uh, I think it is very important that the people, the family members who have to go on living with the death of their loved one, that their wish is respected also, up to a certain amount, not completely, not 100%. There is a, a moment where uh, we have to respect only the wish of the person who wants to die. At the moment we have a problem from the UK with somebody 
a lady with a pain syndrome, polyarthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, an awful pain syndrome, and she has been stopped by her husband twice to come. She had a date twice and she has been stopped because what we always see when you have a date, you sort of so relaxed that you feel a little bit better, you might do this or that with your husband and you have the impression, oh, you're much better, no, don't go, don't go. And she had to um, cancel <coughs> two times. And now last week I had a phone call from the husband, not from her, but from the husband and he begged to take her on as soon as possible. She is so extremely bad. This is the moment where we got them together and she can die. Remember the film Simon's Choice? I wanted to give Debbie, the wife of Simon, the time to get used to the wish to die. But she couldn't let him go because she lost so many people before. She was holding on to this last person, her most important person, until he tried to hang himself in the garden. And this is the moment where she saw, I must let go now. And she came and it was okay for both of them. And she is, she, she is living now with a feeling that she can cope with his death. If she would have, he would have gone earlier, it would have been okay for him, but she would have had maybe a big problem with her whole life. And she's a young person. Difficult point. Uh, I'd like to start by reiterating the point you've just been making. I personally had an advanced direct of a living will for at least 10 years and sharing it with the family and speaking with my doctor about it means that there's an opportunity for dialogue and clarity of understanding and I recently entered another decade in my life so I updated my living will and uh, again shared it with the family and the uh, went and met with my doctor to explain it so that on my records that it was clear and there was an opportunity for dialogue. So just yes. reiterating the thing. Yes. But my, my question really is uh, what your opinion is because I think in terms of the UK uh, two strands that are undervalued for changing the law to enable assisted dying is one and I'm not sure how many others in the room here saw it but there was an article in the Times at the end of June and it was headlined, there is no fixed limit on the human lifespan, scientists suggest. And it was a, a, a reference to four groups of American scientists who are, who are fiercely rebutting a famous claim that we will never live to be 125. With advances in our understanding of how our bodies break down as we age, some researchers say it should be possible to extend our life by decades through new treatments as well. I met recently with my MP and suggested to her that if that such medical and scientific developments and interventions which are determined to extend life are legal, it should be equally legal for someone, according to robust regulation, it should be equally legal for someone to say no more and to die peacefully at a time of their choice. And I, I wonder what your opinion is. And the second strand of that same argument undervalued is uh, I looked at this, the, the statistics, the more, most recent official statistics for smoking deaths, that tobacco is in theory a regulated availability. I'm not sure many smokers are on them. And I know the packets say that, that uh, smoking kills, but the most, the most recent accurate official statistics for England for 2015, around 79,000 deaths are attributed to smoking, approximately 16% of all deaths. And again, it seems an undervalued argument that if such medical and scientific intervention to extend life or smoking tobacco availability is there but it is responsible for 16% of deaths, it should be equally legal in a robust regulated way for someone to say rather in my suffering please. The, the part with the tobacco is very interesting. This is palliative care. Do you know how people with uh, tobacco problems, with emphysema, oxygen, with cancer, you know how they die? Yeah. Not with an assisted dying or not 
uh, well, they can die with an assisted dying, but usually they die with palliative care in a very, very difficult way. Yes, yes. But, uh, but you want to say they, they are allowed to kill themselves, sort of. Why are they allowed to kill themselves and assisted dying is not accepted? That is very reasonable. Yes, it's, it's right, but the difference between is one is palliative care and the other one is suicide. And suicide is a no-go. And you will be punished by God if you kill yourself. The religious, religious uh, thoughts are a big, big, big blockage. A big blockage. So just to come back to your passion about we're punished by God and there's another reference to religious. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but I occasionally speak to the Jehovah's Witnesses and other Christians in the street. Excuse me, would you change the law to enable us just to die? And Because at the core of your faith is Jesus, who in his 30s deliberately and knowingly put himself in a position where he would be killed. <laughs> the first, the first few moments on the cross when he thought, oh my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He realised he was following his father's will toward the resurrection and the afterlife. And perhaps if someone declares a wish for assisted dying, they're going against humanity's endless intervention to extend life uh, beyond what God's will actually is. <laughs> I'm just wondering how many people just sort of roughly from the UK do come to Life Circle because I think most people in this country only know about Dignitas so I'm just thinking about you know, if somebody is looking possibilities of assisting there's how, what are the sort of things that one might look at to see whether one would contact Dignitas I mean, or, or yourselves I mean I understand the point that made you to set it up that you want to support people in life as long as possible so that it's not just suddenly the death part of it um, but I'm just wondering you know any other aspects of comparison and how many people do come from this country as I as I work for Dignitas for six years I know that at least five times the amount of people who come to life circle will go to Dignitas or ex-international um, and this is good that way I'm happy about it because the reason why I founded Life Circle is not to do as many assisted dyings as possible it is to help with legalization it is not a solution to come to Switzerland it cannot be that going to Switzerland starts meaning I go, I'm going to kill myself in Switzerland this is awful and uh, the suicide tourism to Switzerland has to stop. I do not know how much Dignitas is doing for legalization work, but I want to do everything that I can. Uh, we have too many, far too many people asking help with us. And I have just had a, a talk with the, uh, with the board of the association whether we should stop taking members because it cannot be that we take on members and then we have no dates for assisted dying because we have too many members and the people from people from switzerland are not the problem because they become members long before they fall ill but the people from other countries you know father death is knocking at their door and then they realize i should do something about it i do not want to die in a horrible way and then they ask and they become members and we have no dates to give them assisted dying. That's a big problem. I do not want this to happen. So uh, we do not want to have more than 80 assisted dyings per year with Life Circle. And of these 80, there are about, um, I, I think about 20 would be Swiss and 60 would be foreigners, which means we have very few dates for foreigners, which is actually horrible, but it wasn't meant to do as many assisted dying as possible. We have to change the law. We all have to try to help and change the law. Um, I, I want to tell you a little slightly heartwarming story, which involves, I think, one of you're one of our patients that we both have, a woman of 99, 
But before that, I just want to make the point that anyone who thinks that education is going to solve this problem only needs to look at Soviet Russia, where for a uh, hundred years, about well, seventy years, religion was hounded, persecuted, and suppressed. And Russia is now one of the most religious countries in Europe, in this part of Europe. And uh, the, the, the rise of religion is happening. I, I think it's only a partial rise, and there's also, of course, a rise in secularism. But in countries in America and in Australia, the only places that managed to get a system dying were states, parts of Australia, parts of America. In a country like ours, where the whole country has to be involved, where they well, sorry, Scotland accepted, and even, <laughs> even there things are not, uh, are not progressing very rapidly. I, I am not happy. I am not optimistic about the pace of change. Uh, but the um, I want to make a practical point that anyone who who uh, arranges to go to Switzerland, either Dignitas or Erica, uh, we have set up. Uh, Penny, unfortunately, who runs the group, is not here today. There is a uh, a support group for people, families who who are planning assisted suicide, and also for supporting the families afterwards. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to give details of that. Yes. A heartwarming story is, um, this is a 99-year-old woman, I think you, you, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. this is a woman of 99 who, uh, who, who was co cognitively in very good health. When I saw her in her flat, there was a computer going, and she said, I play bridge twice a week. But she was 99, she was getting uh, uh, a lot of small conditions which cumulatively were making her life not very good. Uh, she wanted, she arranged to go to Switzerland when uh, her son said, if you go to Switzerland, I will kill myself. <coughs> so she put it off until he was on a long cruise in the Pacific. <laughs> her son was in about in his 70s. And she, uh, she went to Switzerland and um, I think an, uh, her niece popped into her flat um, to, to tell her that she was about to get married and found a suicide note, Contact, contacted, I think she contacted you actually, didn't she? No, no, she, no she contacted the Interpol. Oh, that's <laughs> it. And then eventually, the son, uh, this all came from notice of the son, and they all died happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> the son was reconciled, and, uh, and she, had, she put off her suicide, uh, her assisted suicide, to attend the wedding of her niece, <laughs> and, uh, and so it all turned out quite happily. So certainly involve the family and give them time, and usually they will come on board. Do you know this is one assisted dying that I will never ever forget my whole life. I will never forget that, forget that lady at the age of 99. Her mother had a stroke at the age of 99 and lived on until 105 in a very bad nursing home and uh, this lady was suffering with her mother for six years and she said this will not happen to me but she was still playing bridge she had organized a bridge game with her friend on Monday the day she wanted to die and she took the phone off my brother phoned her friend and said look I can't come for the bridge game tomorrow <laughs> and this this friend said, well, why, why are you not coming? Why well, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. And this is why, you know, she had the phone off of my brother, because we were stupid enough, stupid enough to let her phone with the phone number of my brother. And they knew she is in Switzerland, so we had Interpol immediately uh, on, on our feet. And this is why I told her um, to set back the assisted dying, wait for the wedding of Denise, wait for her son to come home. And why I will not forget this assisted dying is, the son came with the two grandchildren, granddaughters. She was lying in bed, the son was sitting beside her, and the two grandchildren were standing on both sides of the bed, and they were holding hands. In the middle they were holding hands with each other and here the hand of the grandmother. And both were crying when she opened the perfusion. Both were, you know, the tears were running down. 
And the son was sitting there and said, be strong, my, my daughters, be strong, my daughters. And this was, this is culture of saying goodbye, not running away while the son is on holidays in New Zealand, but facing the fact that he wanted to go. And when he came back, he could perfectly understand. I had a good phone call with him. He could understand and he said, I will of course come with my mother and hold her hand. That's the way it should be. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this the last question um, to give Erica a bit of a break, but hopefully she'll be around afterwards and we can have uh, a, a bit more informal discussion. So last question. Uh, um, as I understand it, uh, if you go to Dignitas, they give you something horrible to drink. But you talked about injections. Uh, do you offer an alternative to people who understand needles? And that's meant seriously. I think this is a little bit our problem. This is a reason why people want to come to us. I am, I am a doctor and I do not want people to drink something that is not made for your stomach. It is, it is uh, anesthetic which is very alkaline and it can, it does not have to, but it can burn uh, in your throat, in your stomach. And this is why Dignitas gives chocolate right after drinking the medication. Dignitas uh, is not working with doctors. They have doctors to do the judgment, but at the assisted dying, there's uh, not a nurse, anybody from the street could do assisted dyings with Dignitas. They show them how to give the, the, the medication to the person, not forget the anti-vomitive before. If not, you throw it up immediately and then they drink it. And if it is not done by perfusion, by, by infusion, um, there is no real need that the doctor is around. If you do it with intravenous application, there is the need that the doctor is around. I know that Dignitas once made it with intravenous application because somebody couldn't swallow anymore. The doctor went there, put the intravenous needle, took off again, and then until they ap uh, applied the medication, the needle moved a little bit and it went out of the vein and they had an awful big problem. Uh, things like that must not happen. And I think medically assisted assisted dying should be uh, should be done. This is the way it should be in Switzerland everywhere. Exit in Switzerland, the big Swiss organization, uh, they have uh, 125,000 members and they are doing about uh, 700 to 800 assisted dyings a year which means this is about 1%, 1, 1 to 1 to 2% of all deaths in Switzerland are assisted dyings. They only work with oral application. Uh, I do not want people to have a burning sensation in their stomach while they wait to fall asleep and it takes about uh, 2 to 4 minutes until you fall asleep when you drink it. You know how long it takes to wait for two or two or four minutes when you have this burning sensation in your stomach and you can't concentrate onto your loved ones. Um, these are reasons why I, I, I want to work with intravenous application. But again, this is a big problem because people start to know and then they want to come to Life Circle and we haven't got the possibility to take uh, many more people. Okay, um, so I'm going to just put a, a stop to questions at this point to give our a, a break. Hopefully, as I say, she'll be around uh, for the rest of the afternoon uh, and, and we can have a less formal chat. So uh, please join me in thanking Erica. She's given us a wonderful applause.